Sermon four of not a fan. You not a fan of Jesus? How many of you are not a fan of Jesus? Not a fan. Look at you. Not a fan. How many of you are a fan of Jesus? Well, got a couple. Well, if you're a fan, you're a follower too. Amen. Got to be a follower. We're doing sermon four of not a fan, and it's called the comfortable cross. The comfortable cross. Ran out of bottled water. Have you made your cross comfortable? Watch out. Have you made your cross comfortable? Fans have a comfortable cross. Followers do not. Do you know what comfort is? I know y'all understand what comfort is, right? Okay. Are you comfortable? Okay. Until I keep going in and out, right? Comfortable. uh, Okay. You have a choice between a Tempur-Pedic mattress that you can have today or I can give you a box springs that we've been using for 25 years, of course, you know. Or how about, yeah, Tempur-Pedic, of course. I mean, come on. Uh, You have a choice. You're going to go on a five-mile walk today, and you have a choice of wearing your best pair of tennis shoes, your favorite pair of tennis shoes that are very comfortable, or you can be given a pair of wooden uh, clogs that have been handed down generation after generation, generation. Everybody's going, come on, man. I know which pair I'm going to get, right? How about this? You can go on a week's vacation to the most elaborate spa there ever is with unlimited massages. Oh. Or you can spend a week in the desert outside of Barstow, California in July in a pup tent with limited water. Well, come on. Right. Now, I know that was a loaded, a loaded set of questions. Everybody picked the ones that have a common denominator. That's part of math. And denominators... <laughs> okay, what's the common denominator? Comfort. Comfort. And we are creatures of comfort. We are creatures of comfort. Our society has placed... A high value on comfort to the point where people make money off of providing comfort for us. A lot of money. Products that we want just because we want to be comfortable. I mean, remotes. Everybody here. How many of y'all actually get up and go and change the channel every time that you need to change? Is there anybody left that does that? Well, I got one. And that's not because you want to, is it? Okay, here we go. We want to be comfortable. A lot of money. Memory foam. If you go and get in my motor home and look at our king bed. Now, Ethan don't have one yet. He's a young man. But me and my wife have memory foam on our mattress in our RV. That's comfort. Lazy boy sitting there with that remote control watching TV. We have one that massages you while you're watching TV. Some of y'all been to my house. You've seen that one, huh? It's kind of uncomfortable till you hit the buttons. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. But that's what our society teaches us, and that's what we've become, creatures of comfort. On top of that, there's TV shows that basically exploit the love of our comfort by letting us watch. How many of y'all ever remember, I don't know, maybe it's still on because I don't watch TV, so this just came, Dirty Jobs. Dirty Jobs. So you're sitting there having a good time laughing about Dirty Jobs in the comfort of your home watching it. Okay, glad that you don't have that job, you know. But I want you to know there's a danger to always wanting to be comfortable. Is your cross comfortable? Do you have a comfortable cross? And I, when I talk about that danger, I'm not just talking about gaining a few pounds because you sit in a lazy boy chair from October 31st to about now and put on about five of the 35 that you lost. Been there, done it. Time to go back to the gym. But what I'm talking about when you put more of an emphasis on comfort than anything else, our faith is fixing to follow suit. Listen to me closely. Our faith will follow suit. Now, we've become Christians of comfort. If you think about it, the fans are on, the AC is going to get turned on when we get too hot, or in the middle of the winter when it really gets cold, the, a- the, 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 the heat gets turned on. So we're what? Comfortable. We have cushioned seats. 
We have cushioned seats that you're sitting in. They're comfortable. But yet we got some people going, no, they're not. We go to another church and they go, you know what? These seats ain't comfortable. We need the seats at this other church. I'm going to tell you what. I looked around again today more than I normally do because I want to see how many people don't. I only sit in my chair 30 minutes. I'll tell you, my chair is a lot more comfortable than yours because I only sit in mine 30 minutes. If you got up and praise the Lord for 30 minutes, you'd only have to sit in it for 30 minutes. Amen. <laughs> then it'd be a lot more comfortable. Praise the Lord. But you see, we, we want that comfort. And I admitted, I told my wife, yeah, I'd like, I was looking at, I, was, I wasn't coveting, Lord. But those chairs we sit in when we went down there to Grace Bible Church were really comfortable. Amen. How many of y'all went? How many of y'all wanted to take one of them chairs and bring it back? Amen. We're, we're creatures of comfort, and we like it. But it follows along with not just our Bibles and our seats and stuff, but then the message. We got pastors that make the message comfortable. Mm -mm. Okay, so, so, so you come here for a message, and you leave feeling good about yourself. Well, I've had a lot of people share with me that they don't always leave feeling good about themselves. Most of the time, they leave feeling like they need to be, they need to be changed. Amen. But the doctrine becomes lifeless because you become comfortable, not only in your seat, but with what the preacher's going to say. And a lot of people, they go around from church to church to church till they find a pastor that's saying what they want to hear. Are you listening this morning? Mm -mm -mm. But the message is not padded if you just truly teach the true word of God. Amen? In Luke chapter 9, same one for the last three weeks, says, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So now, if you're a comfort, a comfort crazing, a comfort, a comfort craving fan, whew, got that one out. If you're a comfort craving fan, what do you do with the cross? <laughs> you got to make it comfortable. What are you going to do with the cross? I mean, it's pretty hard to avoid it. If you're a Christian, you, can, you ain't got no choice. The Word of God talks about the cross. What are you going to do with the cross? Mm -mm -mm. What do you do with a phrase like that? Mm -mm -mm. What I found is that fans eventually make it comfortable. Fans make the cross comfortable. They create a comfortable idea of what the cross is. And I bet everybody in here, I'd like to know how many of you have actually heard this, this said. Quote, we all have our crosses to bear, unquote. How many of y'all have heard that? Wow. Well, and you know what? Now, here's what a fan does with that. We all have our crosses to bear, and they're talking about menial, everyday tasks. Come on now. They're talking about inconveniences. They're not talking about a real cross. They're not talking about a real sacrifice. They're talking about you having to wash dishes because you didn't want to wash dishes. Y'all, I'm getting some north and south. We all have our crosses to bear. The cross gets pushed back out of the sermons. It gets pushed back out of the Bible studies, and it only shows up every year during Easter. It, it does. And even though it's on our churches and it's on our T-shirts and it's around our necks, I can't take it off. I guess i got to leave it on the rest of the service. It becomes a decoration. And you guys have seen plenty of people on TV with great big crosses, and their language tells you they don't know Jesus Christ. They'd be wearing this going, you know, you, you know and they're making saying things that they ain't got nothing to do with our Lord and Savior. That's somebody with a comfortable cross around their neck, and they'd be a fan. Yeah, they're not even a fan. That's close. That's true. That. Why? But what are we supposed to do with the cross if we want to be followers? Well, it makes it rough. You know, the, cro the cross is a tough shell. Or sell, I mean, it's a, it's a tough sell. How are we, how we going to sell the cross? Because we want to bring people in to know Jesus Christ, amen? We want people to know Jesus. We want people to come into the body of Christ for fellowship, for, for having a more intimate relationship with Jesus, to reach the next level. That's what it's about. Oh, it's not about this. I forgot to make that announcement. So if you haven't done it yet, there you go. Glory. It's not about that, Okay. That's what keeps the lights turned on, but that's not what, it, what it's about. It's getting into growing into the Lord so you can be, oh, man, a warrior for Christ. Letting people know about Jesus. Be radical. Be addicted to Jesus. Mm, that's what it's about. But what do you do with the cross? How are you going to sell the cross? Well, you're going to have to make it comfortable. <laughs> uh -uh. 
you sit back and you, as a fan, you say, isn't it kind of ruining Christianity? I mean, for us to have a decent public relation, we're going to have to get the cross out of the picture. And I got a brother in here. I think he's in here right now that shared with me that he goes to church at another place once in a while. One of the things that bugged him is there ain't no cross in the church. There's 12 crosses in this room right now, counting the one around my neck that I could count. Uh-oh. But there, there, there's like 11 or 12 that are just mounted around here. And, they, and he liked that because some people hide the cross because the cross of what it symbolizes to a fan. Amen. So we want to sell Jesus. We want to make Christianity more appealing. We want people to come in. We need to hide the cross. We need to make the cross more comfortable. And we get into a mode. How many of y'all tried to sell Jesus? I have shared with people. I tried to sell Jesus. I tried to sell the best part of him to people. I am guilty of it. I want people to come in and know Jesus. But what do we sacrifice when we do that? What do you sacrifice by selling Jesus Christ? Glory. Sometimes in an effort to get as many people as possible to follow Jesus, I have, with good intentions, made following him sound as attractive, as appealing as possible. And so I've talked a lot about the unconditional joy, the peace that passes understanding, the grace and mercy that frees us from all of our guilt and shame. Those things are true and they are beautiful and they should be spoken of often. But I've realized that I have been guilty of selling Jesus. I've emphasizing only the parts about Jesus that I thought people would like. Imagine it this way. Imagine if my oldest daughter grows up and goes to college and after a number of years isn't married, but she really wants to be. And so I decide to help the process along. And I take out an ad in the newspaper and I put up a billboard sign and print up t-shirts begging someone to come and choose her. Wouldn't that cheapen who she is? Wouldn't that make it seem like they were doing her a favor? I would never do that. If you want to come and get to know her, you better come with everything you've got, or I'll send you a packet. Better come with everything you got. It's a good thing I didn't raise a daughter, because she'd still be 35 years old and not married. I don't know. So. Better come with everything you got. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul talks about how the world sees a cross, how the world sees the cross. The message about the cross doesn't make any sense to lost people, but for those of us who are being saved, amen, it is God's power at work. Glory. That's, that's the CEV, amen, contemporary English version. For those living in the first century, the cross was the ultimate symbol of weakness. First century. It was the ultimate symbol of weakness. Look at what it was used for. For many then and even now today, and you know some folks that are lost, they don't even want to hear about the gospel. And the gospel, you know, is Jesus Christ came down from heaven in the form of a man, and he died on the cross. He was crucified on the cross. That's foolishness to the world. They don't want to hear that. They don't believe it. It just doesn't make any sense to them. And they, 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 their thought pattern, I mean, why would God use a symbol of torture? Why would God use a symbol of death? Why would God use a symbol of weakness to save the world? You see? First century. I, I suppose the idea of the cross seems more appealing because we no longer use it to crucify people. It seems more appealing to us because it's not used at the square or around the corner at the prison to crucify people. Amen? But we have dressed it up even more. We're seeing the cross as an ornament, or as a, a, as a necklace, or as a decoration. 
But if a first century Jew walked in the door right now and saw an illuminated cross with a rope on it, he would think we were sick. He would think that there was a problem with us. It would be like if you wore a necklace with a guillotine hanging on it. Or if you had a pair of earrings with electric chairs. Come on. Uh, we would know those people were sick. So they're having a hard time with this cross thing. And so is the people of the world today having a hard time with the cross. But I think that was God's point all along. That's what makes the cross so beautiful to you and me that believe. Amen. He takes what from a human perspective is foolishness, okay, that no longer has glory or honor, and he finds the least likely symbol of love and life, and he says, I'm going to use that. I'll show them. I'm going to use that. He takes what the world says is foolish, demeaning, shameful, and he says, watch this. I'm going to turn it into the power of salvation. Amen. Woo! Amen. That's what we're excited about. Amen? Although some of us have a comfortable cross. I think you're getting this. So in first 18, 118, it, it's, what he's saying is, I'm going to take the foolishness of the cross, and I'm going to turn it into the power of salvation. Isn't it awesome? But if you look down at uh, 22... In the King James Version, it says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. We preach Christ crucified, and that's a stumbling block to these people. Hmm? Now, the Jews and the Greeks ain't changed, folks. I'm talking about in manner, not personal cultures. Well, that too. But they're requiring a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, knowledge, knowing, and this drives them nuts. Who else but God could take a cross that represents defeat and turn it into a symbol of victory? Wow. Who but God could take a cross that represents guilt and turn it into a symbol of grace and mercy? Who else but our God could take a cross that represents condemnation and turn it into a symbol of freedom? Who but our God could take a cross that represents pain and suffering and turn it into a symbol of healing and hope? <laughs> Who but our God could take a cross that represents death, represents death, and turn into a symbol of life. Woo! Are you getting excited a little bit? Anybody wants to say amen can join me today. Woo! I'm getting excited. It's all over me now. Who else but our God could do that? No one else. Now, that seems like the ultimate moment of God's weakness, Jesus dying on the cross, and in reality, it becomes the ultimate moment of God's strength and power and glory. Amen? And here's why that matters. It took me long enough to get there. But this is why it matters. And if you don't get anything else, if you don't remember one single slide or anything else that I said, you need to remember that what God did for the cross, He can do for you. Amen. Woo! Take our weakness and turn it into strength. Amen? That's when we are at our weakest that God makes us our strongest because He becomes our strength. Amen? We have to let Him do that. Mm. In verse 27, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Mm. Mm -mm. That's NIV. Whew. Paul says that God chooses the weak things. Amen? Some of us, especially, I, get, I know I keep saying this, you know, the men thing, but we're the ones with all the pride. We're the ones that don't want to quit. We're the ones that just keep on going and keep on going. We can do it ourselves, right, men? We can do it ourselves. Until we finally reach that weak point and we just get down and say, I can't do it anymore. Then we become strong. Amen. Woo! Throughout Scripture, God has continually chose to use the weak over the strong. And here, here's just a few examples that's, that, that we got. Abraham was old. Jacob was insecure. Leah was unattractive. Joseph was humiliated. Moses stuttered. Gideon was poor. Samson was proud. Rahab was an immoral harlot. How can you be a moral harlot? Uh, David was... <laughs> David had an affair. And he was a murderer. Elijah was suicidal, Jeremiah was depressed, Jonah was disobedient, Naomi was a widow, John the Baptist was eccentric to say the least. Come on now. Ooh, just read on that, man. Peter was impulsive and hot-tempered. Must be related to him. 
Martha worried a lot, right? The Samaritan woman had several failed marriages and was living with a man. And look at what God did through that weak vessel at the well. She changed the whole town. She, got, she left her water behind and went and told everybody about Jesus. They got saved. Woo! Man, I must be the only one getting excited about this. Woo! Zacchaeus was unpopular. Thomas had doubts. Yeah, that's true. Paul had poor health. Timothy was timid. timid. Man, can't you see? Have you reached the point where you're weak enough to say, Lord, be my strength? That's a follower. Fans do not do that. Fans, I got this. I can handle this. Amen? The Bible is a long list of imperfect, imperfect people, basically misfits, and we got to be misfits to be used. Amen. Glory. we got to admit where we're misfits at. Though it seems backward to us, God teaches us that when we're strong, we're really weak. And when we're weak, we're really strong. Amen. It's backwards to the way we do the world. I mean, Paul talks more about this in the uh, second letter to Corinthians in chapter 12. This is an English Standard Version, 9 and 10. It says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am what? Content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Ooh, it's the Word of God. Okay. Not Monty's commentary. It's the Word of God telling you when you are weak, you are strong. Glory to God. Paul says he delights or he boasts in his weakness. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, there's a whole lot of us have a hard time with that. It's not natural to delight in your weakness. Well, I ain't going to tell you what my weaknesses are. That ain't happening, right? How about y'all have been interviewed for jobs before? This dreaded question happens every time. So what is your greatest weakness? You asked that. You're a manager, right? Or used to be up there. You see, so what is your greatest weakness? Uh, well... Okay, I'm a Christian, I'm honest, I got to tell you, well, I have a hard time getting up, I'm late once in a while. Well, we really need that guy, don't we? Well, I have a tendency to procrastinate. Yeah, I can really use a guy like that. You don't tell him that. How about, well, I have a hard time getting along with people and it's hard to make new friends. Well, we really need him on the team, right? Glory. No, we don't do that. Because in the world, in this world that we live in, strength is strength. You can't, you, you have to say something like, how about this? And y'all are going to say, boy, he's been through a few interviews. How about, well, I have a tendency to be a perfectionist. <laughs> wow, we need that guy. I have a tendency, no, that's, that's a weakness. I, I, have, I have a tendency to be, yeah, you're getting this, right? That's one more, um, oh, I, I have a hard time not being a workaholic. Woo, we got some free overtime out of that guy. Glory to God. Woo. You know, there's 2,000 or some or so self-help books that come out every year. They're published every year. So there's people that want to be strong in their own strength. They want to be able to do it all on their own, and that's what it's all about. It communicates one message to you. You can do it. You can do it. Over 2,000 books every year tells you you can do it. Glory. A self-help book. Ooh. I want to give you a short story. True story. It's an illustration. And I could have did this from the beginning and kept the sermon really short. Well, I had Ethan come up here earlier, and y'all saw him. I wanted you to visualize that. I just thought it would be good. Of course, <laughs> Ethan's three times taller than he was when I did this story. He wasn't even quite three years old, but when we were traveling, Ethan had reached a point, and I know all of y'all got children or grandkids. You know how the child finally becomes independent, especially little boys. And he, we're going to go, and, okay, Daddy. And he, he starts putting his toys and his books and all the stuff he wants in that a backpack just like that, similar to that, and he put it on his back, and he was letting me know he was strong. He, was, he had it all under control. Amen. 
And he did great most of the time. But we finally reached a point where we went to a hotel just before dark. And we were a long ways from the hotel. And he started walking and he taken it off and was dra- it was kind of dragging. And he finally just stopped and he just let go of it. And he's just standing there and he's still looking ahead and he don't want to look at me. And he's not even three yet, okay? He doesn't want to look at me. And I reached out and said, I got it, little man. And I pick it up and he looks at it and goes, the droop of failure. Droop of failure. I said, let's go. And we walked about another 25. It wasn't even 50 steps. And he stopped. He turns around and he goes, my feet hurt. Y'all getting that? You see, we try to carry our own loads. We try to carry it all. We put our backpack of sorrows and grief and worries. We put our backpack of troubles and trials and tribulations. We put our backpack on. But we don't never stop and say, I can't do it. All we got to do is turn around and say, I can't do it. God wants you to be a true follower, and to be a true follower, you got to reach on your knees. you got to get on your knees and just finally say, I can't do it by myself. I need you, Lord. Amen. Wasn't that powerful? Amen. The, the, the pre-done message from Not A Fan was almost identical, and I was like, wow, I've lived that. I've been right there. Ethan did the same thing. as I think it was his daughter, but we can all learn a lesson from Ethan today. We can all learn a lesson from our sons and our grandsons. We need to drop our backpacks of troubles, trials, worries, whatever that self thing you're trying to do, and we need to turn around and give it to the Lord, right? It's a test for you as followers right now. Will you let Christ do that for you? Because it's when we let go of our need for comfort. We let, we let go of our need for control. We let, no, we let go of our need for glory and, and accomplishments and uh, uh, titles. And when we let go of all that, and we say, oh, man, whatever it is that's keeping you from abandoning it, and just say, Lord, I can't do it. He'll take the followers that are hanging by a thread. He'll take the followers that are hanging by just a thread and strengthen your spirits. He'll take the followers who are at their weakest moment, and he'll use it for an enormous thing in the kingdom of God. And last, he'll take the followers who are all but defeated, you're this close to being defeated, you're ready to give up, and he'll turn your testimony into a life-giving message of truth, hope, and glory for God to someone else later down the road. Amen. Be a follower and surrender to Jesus, your weakness, today. Let's pray.